This is NTT20 Podcast. Time for a big old EFL recap. We're off the back of a three-game week, but within a brutal schedule, there's still scope for success. Five teams stared directly into the eyes of that week and squeezed off maximum points. Sunderland, Wickham, Reading, Port Vale and MK Dons will get some love on the show today. We're also analysing the player of the season in the EFL so far. Ooh, who's that? And finally, they say every dog has its day and today is Woof Day. We react to the return of Ian Holloway to football management with Swindon. So much more on today's show. I'm Ali Maxwell and he's George Ellick. George, let's start at the Stadium Alight with our league leaders in the championship, Sunderland, who beat Oxford United by two goals to nil and went five points clear at the top of the table. Hi, mate. Hello. Um, yeah, this is, you know, it's a game for me to analyse as an Oxford fan where I can hold my hands up and say Sunderland would just way better than the opposition and swatted them away with absolute ease. Uh, I did my BBC Radio Oxford pod this morning and we were saying off air that it was kind of a bit like the old scrappy do, um, you know, video. It was Sunderland just with a hand on Oxford's forehead and Oxford just swinging away and getting nowhere near them. Um, it was a complete domination from Sunderland's perspective. Um, and even though it wasn't, like if you look at the shot map of the day if you look at the underlying numbers and the stats you know it wasn't one of those dominant performances where it was wave after wave of Sunderland pressure it wasn't an occasion where it was two but had they put their chances away it could have been five or six it was probably a day where if Sunderland wanted it to be five or six they probably could have turned the screw a bit more than they did um, and it was kind of relentless pressure in the first 15 minutes that told after Patrick Roberts had had a, a free kick really well saved by Jamie Cumming in the bottom corner and Joe Bellingham finishing off brilliantly after a lovely cross into the box from Chai Hume. Bellingham was just magnificent all game, really. And it feels like, in my mind at least, Joe Bellingham... You know, when when you and I sat in these sofas in the, in the summer and did our 21 under 21, it felt like Bellingham was obviously there on merit, otherwise he wouldn't have been there. But it was still a bit like, you know, he's obviously good, he's young, he's played a lot of minutes, we've seen flashes... But we're yet to really see him you know, nail down a position and show consistently how good he's been. And since then, I think he's done that basically every week. I think our job, it felt like, was to say, this is an exceptional young player in his own right, but potentially the hype around him has led to maybe a misunderstanding of the player that he is. Yeah. And since then, his development has been incredible. You know, he's played every single minute this season. He hasn't even been subbed off. But what's amazing about him is he's someone who, you know, the goal he scored on on Saturday, it could have been a striker's goal. You know, he got in between the centre back and the right back. Um, it was a brilliant cross from Hume, and he it was a good header into the into the corner. They left the keeper with no um, no chance. But it's more, you know, watching him now and seeing how dominant he is on the ball with the like, pitch in front of him and how he's able to drive into those spaces how he's able to to find wingers fairly easily he's a threat from range like I had a brilliant shot that, that came off the crossbar on Saturday for a second goal he I, I now think he is a real deal you don't want to say the real deal because his older brother is the real deal and you don't want to compare them but I was staying with a friend of mine on Saturday who asked me how good he is and I said I you know I, I now think there's probably quite a good chance that fairly soon we're going to see Bellingham and Bellingham playing for England um because you know he's going to be a Premier League player next season, whether it's with Sunderland or anyone else, I expect, or a, or a top elite level player anyway. And then from there, his progression, given he's still a teenager, is going to be very, very quick. So he was very good um, after they went one 0 up. That was kind of when the the the, the, the way the, the game went was more just Sunderland ret retaining possession, keeping it very easily, not giving Oxford any chance whatsoever. The only shot from Oxford in the first half came from El Mazzuni strike from about thirty yards that dribbled into Patterson's hands. Uh, and when the second goal came, you know, it, it had been coming in, in the sense that if Sunderland were able to control the game with such ease, it was always unlikely they weren't going to get a second goal and they weren't going to make the make the point safe. A frustration from Oxford's point of view that, again, it came from Will Volks just really sloppily giving the ball away. Um, there was a lot to be done after that with Dan Neal's brilliant clip over the top and Isidor finishing beautifully, oh. Van Persie-esque, with the ball coming over his shoulder and him firing into the far corner. Um the run made easier by the fact that because Oxford were playing out from the back, when Vox gave the ball away, Elliot Moore was standing somewhere near the left-hand corner flag and Ben Nelson was about 40 yards away from him. So it was a huge area of space for, for Isidore to run into. But 
the execution of the goal was was, was re- really well taken. I think from from Sunderland's point of view, this is a big win, a dominant win. You know, me and Sunderland fans disagree. It seems by what the game looked like against Luton when they won in midweek. I thought it was a game where they were not at their best. They managed to get all three points. Um, but this was the complete opposite of that, where they just controlled it from start to finish. As an Oxford fan, it's frustrating, but like, you know, it's taken till the end of October, I think, for Oxford to be completely outclassed and not be able to get into a championship game. And that was against a side clear at the top of the league, uh, away from home, and they lost 2 0. So I think you can probably write it off as being not an ideal way to end a three, three day game week. But for Sunderland, as weeks go by and performances, you know, continue to be very strong and at their best at home, apart from the Leeds game, Sunderland just give the opposition absolutely nothing. Mm. And these, in my mind, are, are all pretty integral to, for a, a blueprint for success. Uh, hell of a weekend uh, performance, a hell of a week for Sunderland as well, uh, rattling off a couple of wins and five points clear at the top of the championship. Only one other team won both league games since last Monday's pod, and that's Millwall. They went to Swansea and they won 1-0. They beat Plymouth 1-0 in midweek. Uh, this win at Swansea is their first away win of the season, and they had to be patient and they had to withhold, withstand a lot of pressure. Uh, it was Casper Denore with the late winner, uh, who now has two goals for Norwich, both of them in 1-0 away wins at Swansea. He was set up by Femi Aziz, whose uh, assist was his first like major contribution in a Millwall shirt since joining towards the end of the window. He seized on a loose ball from Lawrence Vigaru, carried it, showed composure and quality to pick out Denore, who slid home the winner. Brilliant week for Millwall, and it ends a good month that got better as it went on. Started with defeat at Cardiff, draws with West Brom and Derby, and now wins against Argyle and Swansea. And those those very notably good early season numbers from Millwall are starting to be reflected in results and in what is a healthy league position of 10th that I think could get healthier over the next few weeks if they continue playing as they are. We can say pretty definitively now after 12 games, they are a genuinely excellent attacking team, Millwall. And for the first time in in years, I can say that it's not just a mega set-piece threat that's carrying them. They are an open play threat and a set-piece threat still as well. So really exciting. Third for XG in the division per FOT mob and massive credit has to go to Neil Harris for that. As for Swansea, it's essentially the opposite. Um, they didn't score a single league goal in the whole month of October. Five games, no goals. Their, their three wins in the first six games of the season was a, is almost the opposite of Millwall, was a decent start in terms of points return. It wasn't really backed up by what the numbers were suggesting and now it's no wins in six and I think for a lot of Swansea fans, goalless in five is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for their perception of Luke Williams and the job that he's doing and the style of football that he's implemented where as much as they might talk about the Swansea way and Michael Duff not um, adhering to it in his style of play, now you get into a bit of an issue where what is understood as being the, the Swansea way, you know, I'm sure people have different ideas of what that exactly is, but possession and, and being in control of the football is very much a, a part of how it is generally discussed and they are achieving that, but they're, they're not turning it into anything particularly potent at the top of the pitch. And Hugh wrote a fantastic piece on Swansea uh, in today's ntt20.com weekend notes. Um, Swansea City are in a relegation battle is a direct quote from that piece. There's some really good detail in there. So I would head over to uh, weekend notes on ntt20.com to read a a little bit extra about this. Um, Tell me about Friday night's game between Portsmouth and Sheffield Wednesday. Sometimes there are goals whose quality just makes you laugh out loud. And sometimes the specific scorer of those goals make them 10 times better. Step forward, Michael Smith. Yeah, Mick Smith. Um, this was this was a uh, a really fun game on Friday night, um, won by an incredible goal. I mean, we can start at the at the end, which was the ball kind of falling to... My, to oh, Michael Smith firstly started the move in his own half and then gets up and kind of sprints across the halfway line to get onto a loose ball and from kind of, what, 30 yards? Hits this incredible strike which starts, you know, a foot outside the right-hand post and curls into the top right-hand corner, leaving the Pompey keeper with absolutely no chance. Um, one of those where live you see it and first you're like, who who's hit? Is that? It's probably Windass, isn't it? Like, who? It's Smith. Oh, my God, it's Smith. <laughs> Smith seems to shout, oh, my God, as he's running off into the corner to celebrate, um, reflecting the fact that he doesn't necessarily normally score goals like that. Um, a brilliant hit, you know, and as is the cliche, worthy of winning any game. Uh, I thought Wednesday were largely impressive here, to be honest. I kind of thought the Pompey would, having bounced back with a pretty good performance last time they were well beaten on the road, 
having got their first win against QPR up against the Swansea side. Sorry, a Sheffield Wednesday side who'd really struggled against Swansea. Bit of a theme there in, in midweek. Um, but Wednesday were by far the better team. And the only kind of the turning point in the far, first half was Famwo getting injured. And he's been so good for Wednesday this season. I think his him coming off really rattled Sheffield Wednesday for the last 15 minutes or so of the first half. And that was when they scored their goal. Um, it was a a goal line clearance um, from a, a ricochet off Omani that led to a corner, um, which from the corner, James Beadle, P- Beadle pulled off an unbelievable save where Omani headed it back across goal, it hit the defender and Beadle somehow clawed it up back up from, from over the line, but Ogilvy was there to smash it home and put, put Pompey 1-0 up. And because of the way the game had gone in the kind of last 15 minutes or so of the first half, it, it felt fair enough. But I thought that Wednesday were superb in the second half. Uh, Windass getting the goal, uh, 10 minutes into it, um, and then Smith with a the, with the goal to win it. And apart from a Cam- Callum Lang header over the top really late on, where he probably should have done better, Pompey didn't really look likely to get back into the game. So big concerns for Pompey now. Um, they are four points adrift at the bottom of the championship. Feels to me like their, their performances are on the wane and the belief that the club is, is on the decline and there's just a general feeling that they're not in a, in a particularly good position to turn this around right now. Um, I still think that their really difficult start to the season has had a big impact in this because it was just so hard for them to get a foothold in games. And even though their points return was okay, I think it takes its toll. And it's not a massive surprise to me that we're seeing Pompey, Oxford and, and arguably Derby all you know, see their uh, their performances slide a little bit, as I think probably the fatigue of as to the, the championship campaign compared to the, the compared to League One last season is starting to take a grip and they've all got another three game week again next week and before the international break. So definitely worried for, for Pompey now, more worried than I've been at any other point this season. You made the point that even on paper their their starting eleven didn't look yeah, that like I was... a championship eleven on, on, on Friday night. Uh, yeah. Just looking at the at the FOTMOD page of that game on, and looking at their team, I was like, this is this starting eleven and I really don't want to like be rude about individual players' ability and anyway, it's only my opinion. It just looked so poor to me on paper, you know, to play at championship level, at competitive championship level. That's not to say some of the players aren't playing well and aren't good players. Callum Lang, we've praised a lot in in recent weeks. I know that Devlin had a really encouraging game at right back, a position that he's not played loads before at club level. Um, And and obviously Regan Poole is a player that we praised to to the hilt for, for his performances in the first few months of last season in League One before his injury. But, you know, overall that 11, you know, how, how I would rate that starting 11 is, is about as, as low as possible in, in the championship. So I do feel a little bit for the tools that, that John Messino has at his disposal right now. And, and we should say a lot of that comes back to injuries and absences. You know, people like Colby Bishop and Connor Shaughnessy would be absolutely nailed on starters in this team so uh, it's not been easy on that front as well um for wednesday peter Lohman wrote a really good uh, overview of of the way that danny rail's approaching things at the moment and his main point is you know improving on the defensive end was really important he called it getting rid of the defensive gangrene by cutting off an attacking limb uh, it's probably the, one of the best bits of phrasing i can possibly think <laughs> Uh, to describe how Wednesday have done very well to to broadly tighten up, um, but it doesn't mean that they're playing particularly exciting attacking football at the moment. Uh, Sheffield United they won two 0 against Stoke City, bouncing back from defeats at Leeds and at Borough. You know, two of their toughest games of the season back to back, and they lost both of them to nil. But at Bramall Lane, it's an absolute fortress at the moment. If you look at their six games so far this season. They basically have one bad half against QPR where they were 2-0 up and somehow threw it away and drew 2-2. But outside of that, they haven't conceded a goal at home. They've won every other game to nil. You can put that down to just an aberration. Um, And I was really pleased for both goal scorers here. Pleased for Big Kiefer, only his second goal of the season. You know, a lot is expected of him, leading the line for one of the title favourites. Chris Wilder is always at pains to point out, and I agree that the work that he does in all aspects that aren't necessarily goal scoring are are a massive net positive for the team. I do believe that. uh, And I don't believe that any of their other number nine type options would be able to to do what he does. However, two goals is not a great return for for a number nine at this point in the season. And I was pleased to see that that shot kind of hit him and, and go in or he diverted it in. And then really pleased for Tyrese Campbell who obviously came from Stoke, uh, left on a free over the summer. He scored 36 times for Stoke over a number of years, but due to injury and due to the, I think, general chaos around the club, his time there really fizzled out. And of course, 
over the summer he suffered the loss of his dad as well which would have been a really tough time while moving to a new club he's, he's being eased in by Chris Wilder he got an, a nice goal here to put them 2-0 up and, and celebrated it heartily as well yeah I was, was going to say lively celebration I think it was a, a tough yeah I'm sure tough relationship at times with uh, Tyrese Campbell and uh, Stoke fans and, and uh, others at the club as well uh, so Stoke not great form at the moment I think it's fair to say the early Chicho Palak era is, is not come with tons of wins um, they did have a chance at 1-0 down from a set piece they had two good chances at 2-0 down as well November just feels absolutely massive things could get incredibly toxic if they don't pick up an, a number of wins and points in November they've got four home games out of six home games against Derby Millwall Preston and Burnley away to Blackburn and QPR it is a huge month ahead for Stoke City uh, we had a massive game lunchtime on Saturday Coventry Luton felt big for both teams heading into it Felt big for both teams heading out of it with Coventry having come back from 2-0 down to win 3-2. Coventry are back. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's back. Uh, that is, a before anyone gets rattled, uh, that is a reference to me saying Luton are back in the betting show on Thursday. And I put up Luton to win this game. Draw no bet. 2-0 up, coasting, and they lose 3-2. Um, but in fairness, it was a game that it never really felt fair that Luton were ahead, let alone two goals ahead. Um, despite... Uh, a very obvious penalty given uh, on uh, on Tahit Chong in the first half, dispatched by Carlton Morris, and then a brilliant finish from Elijah Adebayo, putting away the kind of chance he's missed a lot this season. They were two very rare foray, forays forward from Luton, and it was Coventry who dominated the game pretty much throughout. I mean, I, I guess as an away team, uh, you know, you're going to expect Luton probably not to have as much territory. But the way that they've been able to suffocate the game against Watford, the way that their press, regardless of what some Sunderland fans may think, was very effective uh, against Sunderland, uh, especially in the first half in midweek, they were unable to do that to Coventry, who, who were able to get forward really consistently, create loads of opportunities. Sheaf went close early. Sims had a very good chance, uh, a couple of good chances uh, before, um, you know, in the midst of the first half where they went in 2-0 down, wondering how they were behind at all. But in the second half, uh, things turned um, very quickly. Uh, Ellis Sims getting the first goal. Um, Victor Torp with a really nice finish for the second, having come off the bench. And then a, a red card uh, in the 89th minute. Home is being sent off for, for a second yellow, which you know, that late in the game, how much impact can it have? I think from set-piece situations, probably quite a lot. And that's from where Coventry got the winner um, very, very late on um, in a kind of bizarre goal where there were echoes of what happened to Luton midweek, where in midweek, Jordan Clark was a judge to be interfering with play, where he kind of moved his head towards the ball, kind of nowhere near it, before Carlton Morris stuck it home. Um, I'm, let's not talk about whether that was offside or not, but it was given offside. And then uh, this time around, it, it kind of looked like Latibodier had um, made a similar, but probably closer movement towards the ball. But then you can see that the, there is a, the left back over by where the, the set piece was taken from. Looks like he might be playing him on. I wouldn't say it's necessarily um, clear cut, although I have seen a few screenshots of quite a weird angle that makes it look like it's very onside, but I'm not yeah. entirely sure that that is as conclusive as, as it makes it look. But either way, I think as a Luton fan, you're probably going to feel a little bit aggrieved and think we've had two weird, similar um, moments that have gone against us. But for Coventry, you know whether or not it was offside, I think is basically irrelevant because the performance was so much better than what we've seen in recent weeks they were way more at it their chance creation was was much more impressive it felt like Wright was up for it it felt like Sheaf had control of midfield again Sims getting loads of opportunities to score so you know I still reckon that with Luton's shift in the way that they're looking to play uh, I'd be surprised if we continue to see Luton struggling to pick up points um, I think there will be a turnaround, but I also think that if Coventry can replicate that kind of form and get key players performing to that level uh, going forward, then they should be okay. Yeah, they need to make the most of what felt like uh, a real connection between the home fans and the team and Mark Robbins. He was at pains to point out uh, before the game, they really needed the fans. He was at pains to point out afterwards what a huge role they had played in the turnaround. And... Look, this is kind of vibes-based stuff, but maybe because I was so strong on Coventry pre-season and they have been so disappointing in the first dozen games, I really do feel like the issues are not necessarily like qualitative or tactical or system-based in the main. I still don't think there are like 
huge issues in the way this football team is set up and the way that they're trying to go about winning football matches. I really do believe in Coventry's case, much more so than I often do when, when teams are in a bad run, that it has been a strange lack of confidence, um, nervousness, that sort of thing. And and it's easier to say this about a team like Coventry because we, we have seen this, almost this exact team, be a wonderful team for a big chunk of last season. So we know what it looks like with these players as well. And, and you know, confidence when it comes to Sims and Wright in particular feels like the kind of most important foundation um, to them being as dangerous as we know they can be and as they were on Saturday. So I would really love to see this now translate into um, Coventry going on a, a more, well, a run of more confident performances, shall we say, because I do think that alone will lead to a, a, a turnaround in results. Watford beat Blackburn 1-0. This is a 1-0 win courtesy of a, a Kayembe penalty for a handball that I don't think can really be argued with, that the arm is in a very unnatural position but also felt just very unfortunate from a Rovers' point of view that the situation from which the handball came wasn't an incredibly dangerous situation. So it felt like a really cheap way for them to lose that game and, and I think frustrating considering they haven't won away from home this season, but this was a really good performance. Um, they should have been ahead, really. Can't believe that Dom Heim didn't score his chance, which hit the bar, bounced down sort of half over the line, but not fully. And then I think flicked the inside of the post as well on its way back out of the goal. Um, I was very upset with Andy Vyman for wasting a chance that was laid on a plate for him with the most delectable little dink over the top from Todd Campwell. Would have been one of my favourite assists of the season. Vyman then tried to lift it over the keeper, I think basically trying to score like the, the perfect goal. Um, so I can't be that upset that he tried it, but he didn't quite pull it off. Um, but Watford take the points and, and they put those defeats to Luton and Leeds behind them. I was probably overall a bit more impressed with Blackburn, to be honest, but they are still winless away. Loads of draws in the champ this weekend. Two, three all draws, excitingly. One came in Devon. There's just something in the sea air in Plymouth down at home park. They were 3-0 down to Preston and they drew 3-3. They have scored a stoppage time goal in four straight home matches. 93rd minute winner against Sunderland. 93rd minute victory capper, we're calling it, against Luton, which put them two ahead. A 97th minute winner against Blackburn and now a 92nd minute equaliser against Preston. First half was a complete Preston blitz. We talked last week about them being a bit more ambitious away from home and how it hasn't always turned into wins right just yet under Heckingbottom, but I do think it's a good approach. Makes them look much more dangerous than they were under Ryan Lowe away from home. 3-0 up with some brilliant attacking um, play, some great finishing from Frockier and Potts in particular. And then in the second half, Argyle and just the nature of home park started to uh, reap its, its rewards. Isaka, an 18-year-old who's benefiting from Sissoko suspension with a start here, scored his first senior league goal. Really excited about him. I know everyone at Argyle is, in, is incredibly keen on, on him and, and his future as a an Argyle player and, and who knows, um, someone with loads of potential. Then Andre Gray pulled one back. Then Morgan Whitaker squeezed one in right at the death. So still no away win for Preston. I think overall, despite the, the drama of the game and, and the collapse basically from 3-0 up, I'm still taking positives from their last month, uh, zooming out from this result. I really do believe in their improvement under Hecking Bottom. I think it's significant and I think maybe it's being slept on a little bit. Um, so I'm not, I would be pretty upset if I was in that away end, but I still think overall there's more to be positive about than negative about. Uh, and as for Argyle, well, they, I was going to say they can't get away with many first, more first half performances like that, but... Maybe they can because there's something in the air down there. Uh, we had another incredible game in the same scoreline at Carrow Road, George, between Norwich and Borough. Ridiculous game, this. Um, that started with Borja Saint doing what Borja Saint does uh, with a ridiculously good strike into the top corner after a, a promising start from uh, from Norwich. But things turned on its, on its head very quickly um, with Borough kind of grabbing the second half of the first half and looking just sensational like I was so impressed with Borough for that for that 20 minutes or so uh Tommy Conway was the main beneficiary um of, of some hospitality from George Long for the first goal with a uh a finish um into the near post which I just think if you're a championship club you expect your keeper to be able to stand up and at least make a, a better attempt to, to save it um Conway then scored the second after a really good counter-attack um the architect of which was Ben Doak, who I was massively impressed with his ability to get on the ball and basically go around the outside on the right-hand side and get to the byline and get his head up and pick out 
good like their kind of passes rather than crosses i think is really special and this is what to me makes borough such an interesting side where like all their underlying numbers are very good but you look through their team and it's just it all just kind of makes sense like you've got doke on the right hand side who's that really direct high attacking threat you've got mcgree who's so energetic and so direct you've got uh, and or out of possession can um can, can kind of lead the press from there azaz who's that luxury baller who can just get on the ball and make things look so easy led with with Kome leading the line um or latte lath when he comes on too like from an attacking perspective it just seems to fit uh, and it did for that for that second half uh, as I was finally getting his first goal of the season with a with a finish um kind of on the line uh, just just turned home and Conway had the opportunity to make it 4-1 uh, shortly after the break missing a penalty uh, and that is basically where the game turned because Conway misses the penalty uh, science goes down the other end and scores an even better goal than his than his second um and you could kind of feel from there how quickly the the, the game had changed like in the for the second half of the for the second half of the first half, it basically felt impossible that this game would go any other way than than Borough running out comfortable winners. And this is a, a Norwich side that hadn't lost at home for eleven months. Um, and I'm sure had Conway put that penalty away, then they would then they wouldn't have won this one. But mm. um, they were kind of wrestled their way back into the game. And even though Norwich's pressure kind of suggested they were going to get the goal, I don't think any of us anticipated the way it would come with Kellen Fisher kind of shanking across that Saini Dieng tried to parry away on his own goal line and only managed to parry it onto his foot and then into the back of the net. Um, Kenny McLean was sent off after that for a pretty horrendous tackle and um, it was both late and pretty nasty with the studs up kind of into the, the, the lower shin. Um, and that took the wind out of uh, Norwich's sails to an extent. You know, Barra had a lot of the ball after that but didn't create anything of note. So I mean, Borough will be incredibly frustrated they didn't follow up their impressive win over Sheffield United with what would have been a really impressive win on the road. I think we saw in 20, 25 minutes that when they're at their best, they can just look completely breathtaking in terms of their attacking play. Um, but for Norwich, it's not only uh, a, you know a comeback win that looked unlikely and credit to Long for making the save, but it's also Borja Sainz, who's now clear at the top of the goal-scoring charts, doing his thing and scoring two magnificent strikes. Hit the fop mob corner button. We have to talk about Borja Sainz. Is he the championship's player of the season so far? I think if the season ended now and an award was given out, he surely would be. Interestingly, fop mob, fop mob have a, a player rating um, metric as well. The top of the championship for them, Alex Mowat, Romain Mundell and Matthew Clark in the top three with Michael Cooper, Oli Arblaster and Dennis Serkin four to six. And then Vinny D'Souza at Job Bellingham and then Borja Sainz. But he is the league's top scorer with 10 goals. He is three clear of Josh Madger on seven. He is five clear of every other player in the championship. If you add assists in there as well and make it goal contributions, he's on 12. He is three clear of his own teammate, Josh Sargent. It's been an astounding return from Sainth so far this season. And what a pair of goals he scored against Borough in what was an incredible weekend for the Sainth family, by the way, with his brother Carlos winning the big car race in Mexico City <laughs> and brother Borja uh, at the double at Caro Road. What I find interesting, George, having dug into the numbers of FOTMOB, and some video as well, is that we have a player here who has scored 10 goals from 5.1 expected goals. He has just scored two complete 10 out of 10 worldies mm -hmm. live on Sky. Yeah. And I think those two things combined might lead to a reputation or a feeling that Borja Sainz is a bit of a long-range shot merchant who's just on a bit of a hot streak. Think of Morgan Whitaker's goal return at the start of last season, for example. Then if you dig a little bit deeper and you watch the goals that he is scoring, it's actually the breadth of his goals that stands out. That's not to say that he isn't scoring worldies, three or four this season already. But he's also scored against Preston, a really improvised poacher's finish attacking uh, across from the right, against Hull, running behind and, and lobbing over the onrushing goalkeeper. He scored a front post back heel against Derby from a cutback, a dribble and a low drive from the edge of the box. He finished off a counter-attack in another instance. Against Watford, he ran in behind and finished one-on-one. -on -one. He scored from the penalty spot, sort of clearing up after a cross was cleared to him against Coventry. And he's, tap he's tapped in one after good work from Sargent uh, in another game as well. So I'd say of his 10 goals, three of them have been 
the cut in and smash it in type of goal that is hard to imagine anyone scoring, let's say, 10 of in a season. But then seven of them are more like number nine type goals almost or wide forward type goals. 80% of his shots this season have come from inside the box. So he is not just spamming long shots. That's demonstrated much better by looking at last season's shot map versus this season's shot map. And on the video that will go on our social channels, you'll be able to see these side by side. And the comparison is very clear. The best way for me to explain it with words is that last season he took 54 shots and his XG number was 4.84. This season he's taken 37 shots and the number is 5.16. So already generated more XG this season from 17 shots fewer and we're only just a quarter of the way through this season. So for me, the manager gets some credit here for absolutely nailing the correct role for Sainz to get more out of him than David Wagner got out of him last season, playing to his strengths. And also credit to Josh Sargent, because Sargent has assisted him for three goals this season, most of them tap-ins after great work and, and square passes. And some of the goals he is scoring that aren't assisted by Sargent, are still impacted by the movement of Sargent, the way that he occupies centre-backs when he drops deep, as he often does in build-up. Science is benefiting from that with dangerous runs in behind and uh, goal against Hull and one other as well have come from that. So he owes a lot to Sargent's movement and his selfless number nine play as well. It's kind of feels like the wrong way around, right? We've got the number nine setting up the winger for goals rather than um, the other way around as is or was traditional. Science is, is just a shoot first guy. He's not that interested in assists, I don't think. And if you look at his shooting metrics compared to others in his position, that stands out. Um, clearly, the amount of shots he's taking, the amount of shots he's getting on target, his XG absolutely stands out among wide forwards in the championship. And by comparison, if you look at his passing and dribbling stats, you can see that Basically, in, in any creative passing metric, in any dribbling metric, he doesn't particularly stand out for the quality of his play on that front. So this is a shot volume guy who is finally being put in the perfect role for him. Is a goal threat from wide areas cutting in and shooting, but it's also scoring a lot of other type goals. And I think that's important when we ask the question, could he win the golden boot? even though no one would have picked that pre-season, even though his own teammate, Sargent, is probably still a shorter price to win the golden boot. And I sort of think, well, the last two seasons, we've had players win the Golden Boot who weren't playing like traditional number nine roles in Sammy Smodix and before him in Chuba Akpom. So why shouldn't Sainz be able to win it? The amount of shots that he's taken, the different types of goals that he's scoring. Yes, he's overperforming his, his finishing numbers pretty consistently. But even if you were to even if he was to score at the level that his expected goals numbers would suggest. He will still score quite a few more goals this season. I think it's it's really cool to be able to watch this player in year two of his championship career massively explode in a role that suits him. Uh, and it's been really interesting and I think quite eye-opening for me to dig a little bit deeper into the numbers with FOTMOB. He's also just the latest example of what has been an incredible period of you know, innovative recruitment from Norwich where you know, he's someone who played quite a lot of football in Spain for Alaves, and he went on loan to uh, Zaragoza in the Segunda division. He played quite a lot of football at both of those clubs on the right-hand side as kind of a genuine right-footed right-winger. And it wasn't until he went to, uh, um, apologies to any Turkish people listening, Giresunspor, where he had one season where he was shifted out to the left-hand side, and he scored 10 goals in the Turkish Super League uh, in just one season, in a season where they were relegated. So... There is some precedent here for you know double digit goal scoring goal scoring campaigns, but it's the it's the way that they brought him in that I think is the uh, interesting part where he had a clause in his contract that meant that he could basically release himself from the Turkish club off the back of relegation, and that's what he did, which meant that Norwich signed this guy who scored ten goals in a top flight European league in the Championship for free who played a lot of La Liga football. And it went so under the radar for that reason. Mm. Uh, and they gave him a year where he was kind of integrated into the side, played a lot of football last season, scored some goals, scored some good goals as well. Um, but as is often the case, you know, it takes time for players to, to get used to it and to uh, to thrive. And he's, he's, you know, he's only 23 now. He's played a lot of football in his career. But, you know, this is the club that, you know, going you know, under Stuart Webber, who I think has had to uh, face up to some criticism in recent times. You, know, you look back to Buendia and Puki, but you, more recently you look at Marcelino Nunez and Gabriel Sara and Josh Sargent. This is a club who have proven time and time again how it is possible 
for a championship club to spend not very much money and recruit players who are destined to play at the top level. And uh, all evidence suggests that Borja Science is the next person to do that. Enjoyable FopMob Corner this week. Uh, thank you to FopMob for sponsoring the segment on the Monday pod. You can download the app using the link in the show notes. You're getting shot maps for every EFL player. You're getting so much more as well. XG data, Championship League One and League Two. You can spend hours on that app and we certainly do every single week. So do download the FopMob app. Uh, four other draws in the Championship to tell you about. Derby won, Hull won was Derby's third one-all draw in a row. They went behind a laser from Xavier Simons of Hull, who's already kicking on over the last few weeks uh, after showing a lot of potential earlier on in his in his youth career. Uh, and then an equaliser from another really exciting young player, Dijon Brown, who scored his first EFL goal. Derby's 19-year-old striker, who's got a really exciting profile, I think. He is a good size. He's very mobile. He's speedy. Uh, he was on loan at Gateshead in the second half of last season and he scored six goals in seven games in one stint during March. Uh, it was six goals in total in that stint as well. So he wasn't prolific uh, throughout his spell, but did show in in that stint, you know, what a handful he is and uh, a really nice header to equalise and get Derby a point. Uh, Burnley nil, QPR nil, saw QPR's Paul Smith hit the post after eight minutes. And after that, QPR didn't have another shot. So you can see how this game played out. QPR sitting in shape, Burnley trying to break them down and not able to. They had over 20 shots, but about 80% of them, I think, were blocked or off target. So Burnley still having to work out um, how to, to kind of execute a bit better in the final third. West Brom nil, Cardiff nil means West Brom now winless in six with four straight draws. Uh, 12 shots to four in the first half. They were dominant to start with, but none converted and they kind of ran out of steam a little bit in the second half, I think. And it's another good result for Cardiff, another feather in the increasingly feathery cap of Omar Reza. And Bristol City nil, Leeds nil. Uh, very emotional scenes here as Liam Manning returned to the dugout. Um, the fans with an incredible display of support for him and his family uh, and his team digging in to get a point somewhat under the cosh from Leeds. Nil-nil in three games to end a busy week in the Championship. Next week, we've got a full slate of Championship action and the FA Cup first round. So next week's pod, we'll be able to dive a little bit deeper, no doubt, into some of the other Championship clubs that we haven't gone deep into this week. We start in League One with Wickham, beating Leighton Orient 3-0. Four wins in a row, Wickham, along with Port Vale. They have picked up the most points of any EFL club in the last 10 league games. It's five home wins in a row, George. The stats are pretty compelling. The team is clearly very good. How good, how good are Wickham Wanderers? <laughs> yeah, really good. <laughs> I, I, I think this, to me, I mean... When you have a team who you anticipate are going to be... Can I just say that was really um, Carragher-esque from you there? <laughs> Thank you. When he's about to make a really good point and he just gives himself a few seconds and he goes like... Big breath. And what I would say... Big breath. Big breath. And then he smashes it out of the park. Better than a big swallow. Incredible. And so are you. Thank you. Um, yes, I I think when you take a team where pre-season expectation wasn't particularly positive... And they start the season this well, and you ask, how good are they? I think two things can be can be true. Yes. I think they can be really very good and a genuine contender for promotion, whether that is in the top two or via the playoffs to the championship this season. And I think it is also fair to say that Matt Bloomfield shouldn't now be judged as success being maintaining this current rate because they are absolutely flying. They're playing really well i think when you look at their recruitment in the summer it is impressive what they've been able to do in terms of freshening up freshening up the side and playing a style of football that sits somewhere between what we saw early last season when they struggled where bloomfield tried to implement a kind of heavy passing style to the fairly attritional stuff we saw at the back end of the season that yielded some results now the thing is with wickham to point out as well is that this latest win is the latest good result and good performance in a run that doesn't just date back to the beginning of the season, that dates back to the beginning of February. Because they, I think, were winless in four on the 3rd of February. And they went to Cheltenham Town and they beat them 3-1. And if you start on that day and you take the League One table from that day to now, them and Lincoln have the same number of points. I think it's 60 points from 30-odd games. So going at two points a game. The closest person, the closest team, I should say, to them are Bolton, 
who are 10 points below them. So like Lincoln and Wickham have been setting a promotion rate for what is getting towards a whole season, right? But it just it just bridges two seasons rather than being just for one. So in that sense, you have to say that Wickham, you know, th- this is not a flash in the pan. This isn't a side who've suddenly turned it on from a poor base. This is a team who've been operating at this level for a long time. And, you know, Matt Bloomfield was coming under some severe pressure Wickham, some Wickham fans who obviously adored him as a player were saying, you know, we don't want him to tarnish his reputation any further by staying at the club and ruining it. Whereas now it feels that Wickham have themselves one of the most promising and exciting young managers in the EFL who just happened to have played over 500 games for them and is a club <laughs> legend too. And that is an incredible situation to be in. So, you know, this is just another example on Saturday of a team who are totally believing in what they're doing, who are very well drilled from from uh from bloomfield's perspective and i don't really see why they shouldn't be seen in what still looks to me like birmingham and then who are going to be the teams that are going to push birmingham if anyone does and right now i think we have to consider wickham as being very much well one of the most likely to be in that group really potent going forward the second top scorers in the efl behind chesterfield uh, we saw on Dinma scoring here we saw daniel udo scoring really nice spin and finish after a pass from humphreys that was well disguised then udo repaid the favor and set up humphreys for the third goal those are three of a group of attacking players all of whom I think are are performing at a similar level, which means Bloomfield's got a fantastic um, squad depth at the top of the pitch and is able to uh, make changes in games that don't see a drop-off in terms of the quality of players leaving the pitch uh, and their replacements. So you've got Onya Dinma, you've got Sadlia, who started the season quite well and and has been quiet the last few weeks. Uh, McCleary, uh, of course, you know, the old veteran of Wickham who still, um, you know, really contributes to, to goals and assists. You've got the two goal scorers themselves, who are Udo and Kone. Both of them have been a big goal threat. He's able to rotate their minutes quite nicely as well. And Cameron Humphreys, who's been a bit of a jewel on loan from Ipswich as well as a, as a creator and just a really smart, uh, high IQ player in the final third as well. So really good going forward. Um, pretty good at the back. I still think we are yet to see them truly tested over a long period of time. Nine of their 12 games have been against teams in the bottom half of the table. It's not to say they've all been easy games, but certainly there are tougher tests to come. And that is the challenge. Four of their next six are away from home. Five of them are against top half teams. So for me, it's let's get really excited about what we've seen with Wickham this season and stretching back to February. The the really good squad that has been built, probably the best squad they've ever had. I would say probably a, a better squad and, and certainly with more depth even than they had when they were a championship team. But I'm also going to say, let's say where we are at the start of December, because it is going to be a very, very tough period for them. Uh, And just the way that the fixtures fall sometimes helps get teams on a run and then sometimes leads to a a, a stickier spell. Um, Let's see what happens. We had 23rd against 24th pre-weekend. It was Cambridge at Burton. It was also Burton's first game after sacking Mark Robinson, while Gary Monk in the Cambridge dugout famously didn't get sacked and has now won three games in a row. Yeah, Cambridge showing that, you know, judging a team for their points tally after nine or ten games um, doesn't often tell the full story because they're now the team, having been the team who consistently played in games that were fairly tight when being beaten, they're now the team that are playing in fairly tight games and winning and winning them. Um, you know, the the first two wins against Wigan and Stevenage were helped by deflections and own goals to an extent not to say the performances weren't good but you know they were still holding it, your hands up there as if as if uh, you think the ref's about to give I'm a just, foul and you I'm, you're I'm, trying to get away with this it this season I'm just I'm scarred by seemingly having so many different agendas that I need to seemingly qualify everything I say by, by making sure that I'm not <laughs> so many feuds I just don't upset people anymore um and, uh, you know, in Cambridge's case, as I said, I thought always thought the performances were OK, but they needed a bit of luck. And it kind of happened again here where they were probably the better side in the game. Burton only really tested Reyes from distance. Um, but it was Crocombe in the Burton net that spilled a shot that was then turned home. Um, so, you know, nine points in three games. I think if you're Burton or if you're Shrewsbury or if you're Crawley, you should look at what Cambridge have done and seen that, like, it is only October. You can win three games in a row and suddenly things go from being we are relegated to, hold on, we're already out of the relegation zone. So um, big for them, but all eyes on Burton now because they've got themselves a, a decision to make. 
Yeah. How do you read the situation at Burton, George? Brave new era over the summer with the Nordic Football Group coming in. A huge amount of changes, sweeping changes within the football side of the football club, uh, as well as a lot of regeneration off the pitch as well. When it comes to the football side of the football club, the results have been about as poor as it gets, just four points after 12 games. Uh, Mark Robinson, who was hired to develop the players that they were bringing in, wasn't able to do that while getting results and maintaining a, uh, the desired style of play. So what do they do from this point, given that they have been open about wanting to play a certain way? And as we've discussed quite a few times over the last few years, that can sometimes cause more problems than it gives you solutions in the short term. And it can sometimes make a managerial hire in a tough situation like this. You know, you're the strength of your resolve really gets tested here. It does. I mean, there are two ways to look at this. Firstly, I think there is a very high chance that had nothing changed off pitch this summer, that Burton and Albion would be embroiled in a, in a relegation battle. It is likely they could be doing even worse. You know, They were pretty poor last season. They stayed up by, stayed up by the skin of their teeth. They were always overperforming by staying up, which is the one thing that might have changed now. And their squad building, it should be said, had been horrendous for a Correct. few years as well. So I, I, you know, even though massive respect to Ben Robinson and the job uh, that he did as owner of the football club, let's not pretend that they were coasting as a happy mid-table side consistently. Like they have been in and around the drain, I would say, in, in League One uh, recently. Um, but at the same time, I think there has been some naivety about the way that the new owners have gone about implementing change. Well, not, not necessarily about implementing change, about looking to implement change whilst also achieving on the, on the pitch, where you take over a club and have very little footballing infrastructure whatsoever beyond the manager, who has seemingly kind of handed the keys to, to run the football club. And you want to revolutionise the playing squad, of course. You want to put in, you know, bring in sellable assets to the club, of course. Playing a, a different style of football, fine. I mean, I think if you're a League One club and you are competing with the likes of Birmingham and Stockport and Wrexham and, you know, and you want to take the game to them and play a certain way, I think it's going to be difficult to do that unless you've got players who are technically more gifted than the opposition. 24 players came in, a lot of those from academies in the Premier League who might be better, a lot of those from um, teams outside of England. So, you know, again, innovative recruitment who might be better than, than what you can get normally in League One. In Elliot Watt, I think one of the most technical players in League Two, in Billy Bowden, a player who may not be the most uh, physically able, but certainly technically gifted. So, you know, you could see what they were trying to do. In my mind, though, these things take time. Like, I, I think if you are going to adopt this like, really idealistic way of running a football club, and it's the way that I think personally, you know, I would probably look to want to, if I owned a football club, want to do. I think I'd either do, go that or I'd go full Ishmael at Barnsley mode and just be like, we're going to be the disruptors and we're going to do the same stuff differently. But I think, you know, from a sustainability point of view, from a creating sellable assets point of view it's the right way to go about things but i think if you're going to do that you have to accept that we might get relegated this season like this is going to be difficult to do it's going to be hard to do what we want to do and not suffer in the short term and by sacking mark robinson i kind of think that they have shown for the first time that they're not willing to do that and also in my mind if you're burton and you want to implement this style of football and you want to develop young players I think there's probably an argument to say that you're probably in a better environment to do that if you're in League Two mm. and suddenly you are one of the biggest budgets in the league and you are able to go into games knowing that you have a, a technical advantage over the opposition. So from my from my eyes, it's, it's all eyes on what they do next because reading the press release, it doesn't feel like they necessarily think the plan is right but Robinson is wrong. It almost feels like an omission with like, oh, maybe we actually need to change this. Mm. It's been reported in the press that Gareth Ainsworth is is in the frame to be yeah current odds appointed manager mark kennedy favorite but at five to one not a strong favorite adam hinshelwood who's the york city manager then gary rowett obviously former burton manager and gareth ainsworth like you know if it's ainsworth and that is a for a new ownership group to go from robinson to ainsworth from june to October would be mm. a massive red flag in my mind. Yeah. Although, I mean, I also think there's probably an argument to say that he would be 
a manager who'd be the best person to for a, a you know lower end League One club who want to invest in someone to basically revolutionise the whole identity of football club. I think he'd be great at it, but you're probably not going to get the sellable assets. You're probably not going to play the style of football that you set out to play when you brought in Mark Robinson. So I think we're going to see what the identity of Burton Albion is going to be in this next appointment. And if it is someone with a, a track record of academy management or academy coaching who is going to implement a certain style of play, then I feel really sorry for Mark Robinson because I don't think I think he was on something of a hiding to nothing to be expected to perform both the development role, the shift in style role, but also get results all in a very short period of time. It could be interesting to watch either way. Um, Reading beat Bristol Rovers. I cannot get my head around this stat. They've won more home league games in 2024 than any other club in the top four tiers. 13 wins at the Madstad this season. I just think in these conditions, with the issues off the field, with this team, this squad by which I mean no ability to recruit other than Chem Campbell on loan. With little to no senior squad depth at all. The, the proper senior players, they're like peak age or older players. There's only about half a dozen of them. There's very little outside of that. So little experience in the squad. To have done what Ruben Sellers has done and used the energy of the home fans under these circumstances as a huge reason or catalyst for success of winning football matches in those in that circumstance I just think is absolutely incredible um they rode their luck a little bit here Satiria missed a good chance at, at nil nil uh, Harvey Nibs definitely will be sighing a uh, sighing a sigh of relief good words good speech um sighing a sigh of relief after he went clean through with big Kelvin just running alongside him waiting for the square ball decided to try and beat the keeper himself keeper saved it as you know, that is the sort of thing that really winds me up. Mm -hmm. um, Shaq Ford was sent off for a second yellow where he kicked the ball away after getting frustrated with the refereeing decision. Uh, the winning goal for Reading was a, a really nice assist from Ben, ben Elliott, a smart finish from Sam Smith, and some quite sharp Joel Pereira saves as well saw out the win for them. So it wasn't an easy one, even against the 10 men of Bristol Rovers. But I think it's worth reminding ourselves that Reading's back four are 21, 22, 19 and 16. Andre Garcia is starting games at left back. He is 16 years old. He looks so impressive. He's short. He's young. He is going to be targeted. And they were targeting him aerially here. He only won one of his six aerial duels per, per, per who scored. That's not surprising. And it's not even highly critical. But outside of that, he's so dogged. He's so determined. Tackled really well. Four tackles made in the match. Really smooth on the ball as well. Really quick. Really exciting young player. Another one that's come out of, of Reading FC and uh, what a run that they're on Reading and what a week that they've had. Barnsley beat Shrewsbury 2-0 in the week. Uh, Shrewsbury Stadium played host to some history-making Europa Conference League action with TNS becoming the first domestic Welsh club, uh, albeit not based in Wales, and playing their games at Shrewsbury uh, to win in uh, a group stage of a major European competition. Back in League One at the same ground on Saturday, it was Shrewsbury's third straight 2 of defeat at home. They mustered six shots, one on target, and it was Barnsley who left with a, a fairly comfortable away win with, I should say, some really smart finishes, first from John Russell and second from Max Waters. Barnsley have the joint most away wins in the country so far this season, along with Port Vale, uh, and that was another of them. Tell me about Huddersfield 2x to nil. I feel like I cursed poor Joe Whitworth quite a lot <laughs> on last week's pod, talking about his 20 shots on target save streak which was ended within five minutes of the midweek game. Huddersfield having one of the weirdest seasons of anyone in the world, I would say. Yes, I love it when you say stuff like this. Well, like, I mean, it kind of passed me by because I, I don't really look at um, at cup games, right? But their season so far, four wins in a row to start the season mm -hmm. under new manager Mike Duff. And then in all competitions, they then, then, then lost seven of their next eight. Yeah. They lost them all, mm. apart from one game. Where they went to Bolton right in the middle of this run and then won 4-0. <laughs> yeah. Okay? bizarre and since then they played five games they've won four and drawn one the draw away at Wrexham good team bad team good team but like to the extent that if you, if you take out that <laughs> I mean it's ridiculous if you take out those seven defeats out of eight mm. then you're looking at a team who are quite obviously as they should be the second best team in league one if you take out all the wins you're looking uh, at one of the worst teams correct. in the country yeah so let's work it out <laughs> 
football <laughs> is weird. Um, but this was just such a repeatable blueprint in terms of what Huddersfield will do to a lot of teams where they score from a set piece early. They then basically restrict uh, Exeter to, to very little uh, until they're 2-0 up thanks to, I mean, this bit isn't necessarily repeatable. Ben Wiles kind of driving the ball into the bottom left from about 30 yards. Um, Exeter then has a couple of opportunities late on in the game, um, but they all uh, came, you know, McGinnis had a very good chance that he put over the bar um, and I had a shot saved at half, just uh, after the half, just, sorry, just after half time, which is basically their first shot in the whole game. So, you know, Exeter only had four shots within the game. Um, you know, McGinnis will feel he should have done better. But I think from a, from a Huddersfield perspective, it was just a, a regulation home win um, where they took their chances. So, yeah, I don't know, don't really know what to make of them. I think maybe it's a case where, and we saw it with, with Peterborough last season as well, where they just they were probably the best team in the league either side of one really bad stretch uh, around the turn of the year. And it feels like now, if Huddersfield have, have got over that quite long hump, um, then they should be back up with the mobile. And, you know, as we spoke about with, with Wickham, you know, looking at them, I think, as well as being a team that we have to anticipate will be uh, towards the top end. Lincoln. Good team. Good team. Beat Stockport 2-1. Great performance here after after back-to-back defeats. The first against Birmingham, the second midweek, a 3-0 defeat at Crawley. Um, they went one and down to the assist of the millennium from Nick Powell, who... <sighs> it's so beautiful, though. I'm so upset there isn't seemingly a second angle of this because camera one does not do it justice. Powell gets on the ball, what, 30 yards out? And... He's got Lincoln's whole back line standing between him uh, and the goal. He's got Isaac Alafe peeling off to make a little run to the back post. But for Powell to get the ball to him in any normal technique is is not really possible or or certainly not likely. He goes for an outside of the right foot pass. He manages to bisect like three or four Lincoln defenders who are all trying to get to the ball but just can't quite. And Alafe thankfully finishes it off to make it worthwhile it was absolutely sensational and Nick Powell then pulled the muscle a few minutes later and had to come off which was sad um and Lincoln came you know flying back Ben House with a nice thumping header at the back stick and then Bailey Kadamartri one of my favorite players one of my favorite young players in the EFL uh he scored the winning goal with a header from a corner I really believe we're looking here at one of the most natural finishers I've seen at his age uh, in these leagues. He is so good uh, at so many different types of finishing. He seems to have that innate ability to like, be composed in the final moment so that the way that he strikes the ball doesn't have too much power on it to get rid of the accuracy, but also has enough on it to, to threaten the goalkeeper. He hits the target a lot. He can, he can finish with his head, uh, with both feet. Um, he's only had seven shots this season. He's already scored three goals. And uh, I just really think f- for Lincoln to have a player like this, you know, they're not a team that create a ton of chances. To have a finisher like him at the top of the pitch um, should be massive for them if, if you know if he can stay fit. Um, Chaloner, pretty punchy as always when Stockport lose, which they don't do very often. Um, made a triple sub at halftime, including subbing off the keeper, Corey Adai, for Ben Hinchliffe. No injury there, just uh, Adai had given the ball away in the build-up to the first goal. He didn't like it, and this is what he does, Chaloner, and his track record suggests that you know his quite front-footed, quite bullish management tends to work. Uh, and given that Stockport had drawn so many games in the last few weeks and now lost this one, the run suddenly looks um, poor rather than good. Um, you know, he obviously feels like he needs to make some changes. Uh, George Rotherham beat Stevenage 2 0. Steve Evans and Edge is no more, famously. <laughs> it's now Rod <clears throat> Evans United. Doesn't work. 2 0. No. Uh, welcome to the party, finally, Rotherham United, because this was a really good display. And maybe it shouldn't be, given what we know from Steve Evans, should be a massive surprise that his team turned it on against a team that he left to join them. Um, with that little bit of, I think, Steve Evans would have hated to lose at home to Alex Revels, uh, Stevenage. I also wonder, after such an impressive start to the season from Stevenage, whether being beaten, humbled at home to Cambridge, might have burst their bubble just a little bit because they weren't particularly good here. The player to, to kind of focus on here is Malik Wilkes, who was exceptional. Mm. Um, the goal he scored was a crazy finish. Um, from wide and the, the left-hand side of the, the penalty box. But that was a sixth shot of the game. He'd come close loads, uh, just a really good direct goal threat. Someone who we know can do this. You know, remember that season when Hull won the league in League One, he was the standout player for them. Um, and his goal came shortly after a 
Hugh Gill deflected effort um, that kind of flew very high in the air and then into the goal. Um, but even though the first goal was fortuitous, this was fully deserved for Rotherham, um, who have been surprisingly poor so far this season, but, but were much better on, on this day. Stephen will be hoping that they can uh, return to winning ways soon. Um, for them, it's, I think, three defeats in the last four. Yeah, so um, a bit of a drop-off for them, and it doesn't get much easier with a visit of Bolton uh, tomorrow night on Tuesday night. Yeah, big win down the bottom for Northampton Town. They beat Crawley 3-0. Nice win for them, this. And I think just important for them to win these sorts of games against teams who are, you know, in the bottom six, bottom eight, in order to keep them above that relegation zone. You know, Northampton have had a pretty patchy start to the season. Underlying numbers aren't great. There's a bit of a turnaround of, of personnel, particularly at the top of the pitch, um, that they've had to sort of go through. And I, I do have some positivity around the fact that you've now got Sammy Shushane in midfield in the Mark Leonard role, also a Brighton loanee who has some good technical quality. You've got Tarek Fosu now fit and starting games off the left, Tyler Roberts at the top of the pitch up front. You know, these are quality players, I think, and uh, they just need fitness and consistency. Um, they look pretty dangerous at times. Uh, you know, Tyler Roberts missed two really presentable opportunities before Northampton went ahead, and it was Fosu who smashed in. Um, Crawley just let Northampton play a short corner straight to Fosu, who then smashed it in. It was, it was pretty... Sleepy defending. Uh, an own goal from a set piece, put them 2-0 up, and then uh, Mitch Pinnock uh, mopped up for the third. Uh, Well-deserved. I think really important, particularly because five of Cobblers' next six are away from home. I don't really understand how that can happen with the old fixture computer. I guess, I guess the games that they've missed, it'll be down to the games they haven't played in international break, I assume, but five out of six away from home in a row is pretty bleak in, in the month of November. I think it could be quite a tough stretch for them. However... You know, if these t if these players like Fosu and Roberts are able to stay fit uh, and, and and add that consistency, then I do think they will be a bit more dangerous going forward than maybe they have been so far this season. So really solid win for for Cobblers, good weekend for them, uh, and a good weekend eventually, George, for Bolton. They beat Peterborough one nil. Two playoff teams last season who started the weekend in twelfth and fourteenth. They're really impressed by Bolton here, um, even though it took them a while to actually well the 99th minute to make the breakthrough. Um, not many teams will restrict Pom uh, Posh to as few chances Bolton did. Uh, they had very little. Uh, Ricky J. Jones had a decent opportunity after seven minutes, but that came after Collins had already missed a decent one and kind of Bolton would have gone in at the break wondering how they weren't ahead. Uh, George Johnson put a header just wide. Uh, Victor Adebayoja had a massive chance that he missed. Um, and they were they were kind of Bolton at their best under Ian Everett, I would say. Just dominant in possession, restricting the, op the, op the opponents very little and, and creating loads themselves um, but it felt like it was going to spiral into a frustrating afternoon until very late on when they were given a penalty Dion Charles uh, had his penalty saved uh, by the uh, by uh, Bitter Kapic the uh, posh keeper who then pulled off an absolutely unbelievable save uh, off the rebound from, from Charles a header that he planted and that the save came out to him he put the header back in Somehow he got there and, and clawed it off the line only for Kaladai Lolos to just kind of charge the ball home, basically. And I went back because it felt a bit weird how much faster he was running than everyone else into the box. So I went back to watch um, where he was when the penalty is taken. And he did what I think I used to do when I was about 11, where rather than standing right on the edge of the penalty box and therefore have to like start running from a standstill, he starts like he gives himself like a, a cricket bowlers run up nice. and he just starts sprinting basically when Dion Charles starts stepping up for the penalty which means that by the time the board is kicked he's also up there but he's running much faster than everyone else and therefore he gets Jeez. it pays off because he gets there first so well done Cladai he amazing scenes in the corner rips his shirt off and celebrates um, a 1-0 a win that will feel Firstly, they'll feel justified because they know the performances were much better. Um, having been well beaten by Birmingham is well important for them to show still that even though they were routinely brushed off by Blues, um, that doesn't mean that they can't still be by far the better team against other League One sides. And that's exactly what they were here. Yeah, Lolos for Bolton. Not many lols for Peterborough on Saturday afternoon. Uh, worth pointing out that since that quite embarrassing defeat to Huddersfield, which, as you remember, many people thought might spell the end of uh, the inevitable end of Ian Everett's reign yeah. at, at Bolton. Uh, only Wickham have picked up more points in League One in that time. 
Uh, good response. Charlton Drew 2 all with Wrexham coming from behind twice. Wrexham led after a Coventry own goal and uh, Cannon put them 2-1 up. Gillespie scoring for Charlton from a set piece in between. Um, but a handball right at the end. <sighs> That's the noise I want to make about that handball. It, it did hit his arm. His arm is in the most natural position that an arm can possibly be in, I think. Just behind your head. <laughs> sitting by your side. And the ball did hit it. So, I don't know. What do you do with what your arms when you sleep? Um, I've got a number of different things that I would do. I, I will occasionally put an arm behind my head, like I'm on a sun lounger. Oh, right. I thought you were, thought you were lying on your front there. That was weird. <laughs> no, no. Uh, if I'm lying on my front, I guess I'm probably both arms under the pillow, I reckon. Yeah. Or above Norm your head? Normally wake up with um, pins and needles. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> when you wake up and you can't feel your hand. What is pins and needles? Is what? it a lack of blood supply? Must be. Surely. But it is weird. Feeling. It is weird when you just your hand isn't yours. <laughs> it feels like it never it'll never come back. I feel either. like I've done it before. I've like turned over and it's just like hit the wall. You know, like, I didn't even feel that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, hitting the wall with someone else's arm. Um, it feels like a bit of a dear Ali what and George. Saying, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> dear Ali and George conversation yeah, on the on the Monday. I'll save part. it for that. Uh, Mansfield won one Birmingham. I watched this. Yeah. Yeah, I was incredible. What's weird about this is I was so impressed with Birmingham in the first half, and then all the. Um, Birmingham fans seemingly very frustrated they weren't able to, to kill the game off. I thought the way they controlled the game, having gone ahead, was really impressive. You know, Williamson putting them ahead with a really well-worked goal. They moved the ball really well. Mansfield basically just couldn't get near them because they were so good in possession. Um, but you don't finish your chances. And eventually, you know, because this season they've been so clinical. So this is the thing, finally, for once, they weren't able to um, to, to kind of score with, with most of their shots. And when Lee Gregory with one of Mansfield's first shots in the whole game, managed to uh, to beat Allsop from the free kick. It basically went through the wall. Mm. Even though straight after that, Mansfield, uh, Aidan Flint nearly scored a known goal and then off the rebound off the post from that, uh, uh, Dykes put, uh, put it wide from about three yards. Mansfield were the better team from then on. So a really weird game where I think we saw the best and the worst of Birmingham. You know, we saw that at their best, they are able just to completely nullify an, an opposition team because they're so good at moving the ball and keeping it and winning it back when they do lose it. And they are able to create chances. But in the second half, we saw that you know, there's, there's nothing really to fear, I think. And, and teams can take the game to them and, and have joy. And I think some Mansfield fans probably left the game feeling really aggrieved they didn't get all three points. So a very strange game of two halves where, you know, we all know that Birmingham are their best of the best team in the league. But also, you know, I think some reasons for... A bit of optimism from those who are trying to chase them down. Blackpool are playing Wigan on Monday night after we're recording. Uh, both have lost their last two league games. So you'd think the result of that one would be quite significant for general atmosphere within each fan base. In League Two, we're going to start with a draw because it's also the big managerial news. Uh, Swindon drew one all with Gillingham. Gills, who'd lost five in a row, suddenly had a chance to break that streak because Swindon went down to 10 men early. Grant Hall with a pretty horrendous tackle in midfield that was initially uh, led to a booking. I think the lino had to buzz through to the ref and be like, mate, that's the biggest red I think I've ever seen. <laughs> so you're probably going to want to rethink that, uh, which he did. Uh, Jills went ahead pretty quickly. You'd have thought they would see that out from there, but they didn't. They didn't see it out. Harry Smith at the back stick. Swindon nicking an unlikely point. Uh, Q Bedlam. In the stands, and also in the stands, in theory anyway, is their new manager, Ian Holloway, who takes charge officially today. But after they went one down and down to 10 men, he moved himself down to just behind the dugout so that he could talk to Marcus Bignett and the other uh, interim assistant, etc. Uh, Ian Holloway is the new Swindon Town manager. They sacked Mark Kennedy and very quickly announced Ian Holloway off the back of that. His last managerial stint was at Grimsby. That ended in December of 2020. So that is just under four years ago uh, since he was last a manager at this level. He is, as many of you listening will know, uh, famous for some excellent managerial stints, in particular with Blackpool, taking them to the Premier League and also a long stint with QPR, Bristol Rovers back in the late 90s, early 2000s. He has managed 989 games. He's very excited about the possibility of reaching 1,000. However, in the last five full seasons, he's only managed 
38 league games. That was that stint at Grimsby, which started quite positively, very quickly flamed out with a lot of caveats involving the, the COVID pandemic, which caused a lot of problems for a lot of clubs, managers, players, etc. What do we think about this? Because it, I think it's pretty bizarre. I think that his interview was pretty bizarre. <laughs> his answer to the first question... What else is new? His answer to the first question, which is the easiest softball you could possibly be given. Uh, you've been announced as the new manager of Swindon Town. How does it feel? And he went like, oh, I don't know if I am, to be honest, mate. Last last 24 hours has been absolutely mental. And he basically went, I, I signed with an agent because I decided I wanted to get back into the game. And uh, for, within 48 hours, I'm sitting here, the manager of Swindon Town. Now, Quiddy, I said that live on Five Live on Saturday, and Gary Rowett was, was at a stadium, but on air, and he was like, "Who can I be, in be put in touch with yeah. a Holloway's agent, please? I want a job. Incredible. How did he manage to do that? Incredible bit of agenting from... <laughs> Ian Holloway's agent, who he didn't name, didn't even give him the pleasure of, of naming him. I, I think my strongest stance is what what is the decision making here within the club? If 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 we take Ian Holloway at face value, and he had no inkling of being Swindon Town manager until an agent that he was put in touch with by a friend managed to get him the job within two days of picking him up as a client. If you reverse engineer that, think of it from a Swindon Town point of view, the people who are making the decisions at Swindon Town. What's happened there? They sacked Mark Kennedy. He made no connection with the fans. The results were pretty poor. I, we could probably have a separate discussion about whether they should have sacked Mark Kennedy or not, but they did. And within 24 hours, therefore surely not a particularly exhaustive process, they've landed with a guy who's been out of the game for the best part of four years, through an agent like this seems like a bizarre way of 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 approaching a managerial change a dozen games into the season I, I i totally agree and this is a club who were pretty keen to talk about the processes that went into appointing mark kennedy that it was an exhaustive process and that they're confident they had the right man for the job um it kind of makes a mockery of that to then go through seemingly very little process in order to appoint in Holloway and that isn't to say that Holloway won't be a good appointment um, but as you mentioned he hasn't managed for a very long time at all what's also a huge red flag in my mind is if you go back and if you read the interviews from Holloway after he left Grimsby Town and I'm going to talk a bit about his time at Grimsby in a second he basically says yeah managing at League Two was bad for me like he was at like, all of my network all of my scouting network, everything I know is all in the championship. And therefore, like, he basically said, I don't want to take another job that low because it just doesn't work for my style of management at all. If you're a Swindon fan reading that, sure, you're like, what? What What? what do you mean? We've got our, our new manager has on the record said two years ago that he thinks that managing this level is bad. And this is someone who left a club at the bottom end of League Two who were then relegated into non-league, the exact job that he's been tasked with with, with sorting out now like uh, you and i worked with ollie a fair bit on quest and you know he's a his his adoration of football cannot be questioned he's someone who's been through a hell of a lot in his personal life as well and an amazing guy an amazing guy yeah. and you know t so I, I really don't want this to come across like i'm digging him out or anything like that because it's, it's not the case at all but his time at grimmsby it's it's only fair to Grimsby fans to, to give both sides of the story where, you know, he will say that COVID played a big part in it and really impacted what he could do. Grimsby Town fans would say that he came in under this guise of investing in the club and having a seat on the board of directors. And, um, you know, John Fenty, the owner at the time, basically said that he was going to hand over the, the kind of day-to-day -day running of the club to Ian Holloway as part of this investment. And then it transpired later that he actually hadn't made this investment at all or had made it a very a much smaller investment in the club and that that was going to come at a later date. And then he got, he, he threatened to resign off the back of a consortium, getting in touch with him before the, the deal had been, had been secured. It was basically a period of time that where it was a club in transition anyway, but Ian Holloway's part within it has left a lot of Grimsby fans 
basically pointing the finger squarely at him for the way that they were relegated into non-league. So there are two sides to that story, of course, and I'm sure the, the truth probably lies somewhere in between. But, you know, I don't think we can just say COVID happened and, that, and that's why that didn't work out. I, I you know, I, for, for Ollie's sake, you know, he's someone who, when things are going right, his personality is obviously something that can, can rub off the right way on people. As you said, when he first came into Grimsby, initial results were very good and he was really well liked there to start with before things unravelled. And hopefully, if there is no weird off-pitch investment angles to this, which it doesn't seem like there are, then there's no reason why things would have to get tarnished by messiness. Well, I don't know about messiness. investment angles, but I'm really worried about the future of Swindon For Town. sure. No, no, I, I, I definitely agree with that. But what I mean this is... This is not a stable environment, but what as I, I perceive it. But what I mean is, for Holloway, a big issue for his relationship with the Grimsby fans was that he was more than a manager, right? He was part of the Fenty ownership group. And yeah. therefore, when things got very messy off the pitch in terms of takeovers and things, it all... The, you know, the lines were too blurred and things didn't go okay. At least this time around, all, he, all he's being tasked with doing is keeping Swindon Town up and more, ideally. Um, but I, I wouldn't have, you know, the much more pertinent in my mind than taking Blackpool up or taking QPR up or other things is him giving an interview in the last two years basically saying, I don't think my management style works in League Two. Mm. That is got to be a pretty big worry i'm just i'm just really concerned that it'll all end in tears and swindon can't really afford that because they are one place above the relegation zone to drop to Mm non-league and if it all ends in tears that means they will probably be relegated to non-league and i'm pretty concerned about that so let's see how we go it's uh it's great to have him him back in the game absolutely no doubt about that a real icon i would suggest of of english football and efl football um certainly in my lifetime anyway uh george port vale beat wimbledon 3-2 this vale team keep on rolling five in a row now yeah this game didn't look anything like how i thought it would do this is two teams who for my mind are two of the strongest teams in the league but that's because of their really strong defensive units and yet we were treated to a bit of a goal fest and the main reason for that was because of port vale scoring twice very early both of them through low knees who really shone on the day brandon covered the first of those who scored the first goal and made the first goal and it was scored and made it yeah assisted himself well pre-assist ah persist um yeah it was so good where he basically gets on the ball he's a right wing back gets on the ball and that right channel drives inside cover drive drives inside (laughs) drives inside (laughs) That was so quick. That was quick. Uh, drives inside. You're so excited. But about what's it. great about it is, as he's running, this is a 21 year old kid on loan from Leicester. As he's running, you see him point to Jaden Stockley and just sh- like basically shout, like, run there, yeah. run there. Stockley runs there. He plays it through to Stockley. Stockley gets on it and cuts it back to cover, who then plants it in the, in the bottom left hand corner. Like, so every part of it from like the athleticism to drive, drive up the pitch, they're like almost like leadership to shout at a senior pro and just like tell him where to go. The vision to play the ball and then and then the finish as well, brilliant. The second goal came from uh, another loney in the shape of Rico Richards with a really well taken goal uh, to make it two nil after eleven minutes. Um, and you know from there, Wimbledon, who are used, who are not used to conceding two goals, had to to try and find a way back in. Uh, Stevens missed an opportunity, which we haven't said too many times this season, uh, but Nerfville scored uh, to make it two one on the hour mark only for a brilliant assist from Richards, um, created, again, cover, playing the ball on the right-hand side to Richards, excellent ball from Richards for, for Stockley to, to head her home. So there you've got cover making his goal, scoring his goal, and being the person to, to assist Richards for his own assist to, to, to set up Stockley. And that, you know, for a Port Vale side who have a lot of kind of senior pros within the team, we speak about relatively often, um, and the second guy I should say from Richards was a, a chiseled free kick that came off the woodwork and, and he was a you know on hand to, to, to score the rebound. Um, but in Chislet, Stockley, Garrity, uh, you've got a lot of players who are, you know, Ripley who who made a big save from a scramble late on to to keep Port Vale ahead. Um, you know, just that sprinkling of quality low knees can make such a difference and, and that was the case here. Uh, Hippolyte scored for for, for Dons uh, with ten minutes to go. And then there was an almighty scramble um, with, uh, I think it must have come from a set piece because James Ball was was the man the, the chance fell to. He fired it, Ripley made a very good save and then came out to Hippolyte who hit from range, 
first time. And I think Ripley tap, uh, tips it onto the bar before it balls to force the ball again, who skews wide. And that was a chance for Wimbledon to snatch what would have been a, a huge point. Um, but this is a game, in my mind, between two of the best teams in the league. And even though it looked different to how we imagined, it, it kind of came to pass that way. Um, and Port Vale, top of the league in League Two and, and looking just so strong. Donny got a good one on the road at Bradford, the Bantam's first home defeat of the season. This was a cracking game. Um, definitely go and seek out the extended highlights of this one. Uh, Kyle Hurst has been somewhat in the shadow of Lee Molyneux and of Jordan Gibson so far this season, who have uh, started the majority of the games out wide for Doncaster. But Kyle Hurst started here and he was the star man here. He was probably already the game's most important player even before his two brilliant assists. Because in the first half, he had two good openings, which he didn't quite execute, couldn't quite get it right. Um, but he found the quality in the second half. Two absolutely brilliant assists. The second one I loved in particular, just showing himself to be a really agile, speedy ball carrier, uh, really nimble. And the Bradford midfielders in particular, Smallwood, when he was sprinting away from him, just couldn't get near him. So Hurst, kind of the difference maker for Donny, the goal scored by uh, Molyneux and Billy Sharp, but with Hurst taking the plaudits for me. Uh, Andy Cook, of course, getting a header uh, to make it 2-1, but Donny saw it out and got a deserved win, I think. Um, so in the in the Yorkshire Derby Mini League, we've got Harrogate having beaten Bradford, Harrogate having beaten Donny, Donny having beaten Bradford. So Harrogate, despite their lowly league position, still the um, ch champions of Yorkshire in League Two in League Two so far uh, this season. Um, Morecambe 2, Chesterfield 5. Crazy game. Mm. Derek Adams and Paul Cook gives me huge 2015 to 2017 vibes. <laughs> yeah. Start of the pod. Plymouth and Portsmouth had a right old ding-dong across two seasons in League Two. And they, they were kind of the protagonists. For sure. They had a playoff uh, semi-final against each other, which Argyle won then lost in the in the playoff final to Wimbledon. And then the next year, they went up as first and second. And it felt like they really hated each other all, yeah. the, all the time. So um, Paul Cook will be pleased to have well, won five. Derek points. Adams would have been really annoyed by this, yeah. I think. Yeah. Because Chesterfield had nine shots in the game. Really? One of them was James Berry shooting from 45 yards and it cannoning off, cannoning off the crossbar at 5-2, we should say, as well. So this was, you know, Chesterfield were good, but... Chesterfield are a team that I think have been quite good in quite a lot of games this season and not won them. And this was maybe a game where everything kind of fell into place at once. You know, the first goal from Mark Hande was a deflected effort. Tollett scored, um, headed in a, a free kick shortly afterwards. A really good free kick from Oldacre um, where he kind of went keeper side and I think wrong foot to the keeper. Um, and then the James Barry scored a, a lovely, lovely taking goal from 25 yards just after Tom Naylor own goal. Uh, where he kind of got there just ahead of Dakers and uh, and diverse into his own net. Um, the Dobber and Grimes finishes, you know, Dobbers was a one-on-one -on -one that he, he finished well. Grimes was for, was from a header. But it was just Chesterfield being incredibly clinical. And there wasn't, and, you know, this will be one of those things that Chesterfield fans will disagree with, but there wasn't a great deal between the sides in terms of uh, actually chance creation. It was just the case that Chesterfield took their chances and did so with, you know, certainly with, with real quality for the old day free kick and the, and the James Berry goal. And it's a massive shame that Berry's um, last one didn't go in because it would have been the goal of the season. We also had an away win in Carlisle. Cheltenham leaving with all three points. And this pre-game felt like quite an important game for both clubs and both managers. And it's Mike Flynn's Cheltenham that leave with all three points. And I haven't been very positive on, on Cheltenham all through the summer, pre-season and in the first dozen games of the season. But I am sitting here today feeling more positive because I think Mike Flynn's hit on something. They lost to Swindon a few weeks ago. They lost 3-2. They were behind at half-time and Flynn needed to make a change. And he switched the formation at half-time from a, a fairly stale, quite bleak 3-5-2 that wasn't seeing them create consistent chances at all to a 4-3-3. And they won the second half 2-1. They still lost the game, but they won the second half. He stuck with it and they won at Colchester. He stuck with it and they drew against Bradford. Great results for them. And then here against Carlisle, because of, I guess, the, the way that Carlisle play and the territory they were likely to have, he took out uh, one of the midfielders for a centre-back. So what he's what he's landed on, in my opinion, is the, the sort of formatting of his attack, where now he's got uh, Jordan Thomas on the right wing, he's got Ethan Archer on the left wing, and he's got George Miller at the top of the pitch. And it looks and feels so different, so much more dynamic, 
and creative and uh, and dangerous than they did in the first portion of the game. So um, we saw that here where they were good in attack. Archer scored the goal. It was another howler from Harry Lewis, who, who unfortunately is just a real issue for, for Carlisle at the moment. He's only saving about 50% of the shots on target. And uh, Jordan Thomas went close a number of times as well. They look way better going forward, Cheltenham. And I think credit should go to Mike Flynn for landing on something that's that's enabled that. So I, I think particularly if they stick with this, with Payne the right back, who I think's looked good going forward, and Thomas off the right, they've got a nice little combo there. I think they'll get a lot of attack down that right-hand side. However, Carlisle are in a complete mess. Mm -hmm. Since they appointed Mike Williamson, no club in League Two has collected fewer points and only Morecambe have conceded more goals. And I saw them... A few weeks back against Wimbledon, the alarm bells were ringing. It was a horrendous performance. Things haven't changed that much since then. Williamson has tried a few different approaches in terms of putting different players in different roles. But the fact remains, in my opinion, that the, the squad that has been built for Paul Simpson is completely unsuited to playing the way that Mike Williamson wants to play. And I think... Hiring him to manage this squad is like hiring a, an Italian chef to cook in a kitchen stocked with Japanese produce. Where I love the idea of an Italian Japanese fusion. Italian Japanese fusion. Well, noodles, sometimes, ramen. George, sometimes things are better in your imagination, <laughs> okay. and that's certainly the case with this Carlisle United side. And I find it interesting because instantly you saw people say, "Well, Williamson needs to adapt uh, in order to to pick up results um, and get to January." And why hire him then? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm like, even if you think that's true, and yeah, it probably is true, it's absolutely insane to hire him in the first place because you hire a manager based on what they can prove that they're able to do as a manager. He has a clear and defined style of play, and some people disagree, but I think it has, before the Carlisle job, led to success. His stint at Gateshead was a huge success. 85% of his stint at MK Dons was a, a real success as well. In the same way that you hire Steve Evans, to manage your football team, knowing that you want him to replicate what he's done before and you have a very clear idea of what that's going to look like. But I don't understand why you would hire a manager that plays uh, broadly an attacking shape that needs really attacking wing backs who are used to basically playing as part of a front five and two number 10s who are like really smooth, savvy operators to knit everything together in the final third. They don't have a single number 10 of that profile, which is why we're seeing all sorts of players playing in those positions, unsurprisingly looking entirely unsuited to it. The wingbacks, he's tried a few different things and they're not getting the kind of attack generation that you, you kind of need from your wide players in, in this style of play. He also walked into a team that had lost 35 of its previous 52 league games. So it wasn't like he was coming into something that was particularly high on confidence anyway. I don't think for a moment that he's doing a good job, by the way. And I think there's a lot of aspects of his management style that aren't suited to this situation. So I would question why they hired him for this situation. I don't think they thought the situation was as bad as it was, basically. And I'm a bit confused as to why he took the job in the first place. It's so easy to sit here and say this after a poor start. So much of this, I didn't say at the time, is entirely helped by hindsight. And I have to kind of acknowledge that. But, you know, they said they'd hire a sporting director along with a manager. They reportedly went after Liam Sweeting to come with Mike Williamson and then for whatever reason Sweeting's move fell through they don't have a sporting director now they've got Mike Williamson and his staff it's going horrendously badly there's still nine games until the transfer window opens so you know what do they do uh, yeah and th this ownership group who have done so many good things since they bought into the club including to a certain extent showing really quite impressive patience with club legend Paul Simpson. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid now you have to come to the conclusion that sticking with Simpson and allowing him to build a squad that I don't think... I, I think it could be suited to a style of play in League yeah. 2 that he was trying to play and failing to play. It's, I just, it's a bit of benefit hind like hindsight stuff where I think had they sacked Paul Simpson after relegation or after final day last season, I would have thought that was very harsh. Because I, th I, I, I would say that they... Simpson took over a, a, a Carlisle team in like the bottom region of League Two, threatened by relegation, and saved them and then took them up. And yet, yeah, League One was a bridge too far, but that's not a massive surprise given their, you know, given their resources and squad capabilities. But I think there was reason to believe that he would be 
the better person to to take them into in, into league but two. But we didn't really believe that. We had them quite low in our one. I know. But, I, but so what, your but what I'm stance saying, was that it wasn't looking well, like he would do but, that. But I I can understand why they would think that. Like yeah. I can understand why they would be like, we've got a club legend here, who two seasons ago delivered us promotion yeah. out of this very league, having taken on a much worse group of players. So. Yeah, I mean, it's... So running clubs is quite hard, is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it probably Unless is. Unless we did it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Colchester won, Salford two. I mean, got to get quite worried about Colchester now, don't we? Um, I know that it's one of your stances, and I know that there are still reasons in the numbers to think they'll be okay, but Colchester on 12 points after 13 games now. And a home game, a home, defi- a home loss against Salford, um, where they can't have too many complaints about losing, I think is not what I probably expected to see here a Salford side who having had a difficult start are now up in 13th um, it was a pretty poor game I would say like not much by the way a chance in the first half uh, Kelly, Kelly Namai put Salford ahead before Harry Anderson got one back and then Kilian Kuyasi um, scoring the, the winner with 50 minutes to go or so uh, and Salford throughout the game pretty well um, You know, I think Carl Robinson probably deserves some credit with Salford because they I was pretty concerned about them to start the season um, but you know, recently the performances have been much better. Their away form um, has been quite strange. Where they had prior to this one drawn four and lost one, but had yet to win. So this is their first win uh, away from home, having picked up four wins at home too. Um, and if you look at the teams they've lost to, they've only lost four games this season, and two of those were against Walsall and Port Vale. So um, probably some signs of reason to be positive around Salford, albeit no more than just I was quite worried about them being in a relegation battle and that, that, that now seems unlikely um, but yeah I think from from a Colchester perspective you probably need to see something quite soon um, to allay any fears you know just two games won this season I think it is against Tranmere and and, Col- and, uh, and MK Don two wins in the week for Salford two wins in the week for Crew Alex as well they beat Fleetwood 1-0 in midweek, they beat Tranmere 3-1, despite going behind the sort of goal that I feel like nine times out of ten, the, the push in the back on Ryan Cooney, the nudge, if you like, uh, would normally be given as a, a free kick uh, to crew. But the referee decided that he felt Cooney made too much of it and was trying to buy a foul and decided not to sell him one. Uh, and Tranmere went ahead. I thought the response from crew was, was excellent. Um, and we had Ryan Cooney and Shiloh Tracy at the forefront of it. Cooney with two assists for Shiloh Tracy. I mean, with Tracy, we've got a a, a a a mercurial winger who is being forced to play up front and has scored four like really excellent number nine type goals, two in this game. Um, getting on the end of, of excellent Ryan Cooney deliveries and finishing well first time. Cooney himself having a much bigger impact in the final third than I've ever seen before. His delivery has been magnificent recently. He's obviously scored a couple of goals recently too. The third goal came from Joel Taberner. He's coming on really nicely. Still only 20 years old. He's he's just hit in terms of a total league minutes for crew, about 50, 90s worth. Uh, He's got his fourth goal here. So given that he's, I would suggest, an attack-minded midfield player, probably looking looking to him to, to add a few more goals to his game. I have no reason to believe he can't do that given the technique that he has in his left peg, uh, the quality that he has, which he shows with his set-piece delivery. I think we could see more goals from Tabernet, and I'd be excited to see that. Another standout performance for me is, is Zach Williams at left centre-back. You know, he's been in and around Cruz first team for an awfully long time, but is still um, only 20 years old, which is crazy. And I think the left centre-back role suits him really well, where he can step into midfield, show off his, his technical quality, um, and he's probably not as strong defensively, but seems to be growing a lot on that front. And then it all comes back to Lee Bell, as it so often does with Crew, because they've won 7 of 13 this season. He's just getting an incredible amount out of a, a group of players. The, the squad on paper, and particularly the depth of it, has, has no right to be in the top seven of League Two. And that speaks to the incredible job that he has and also the ethos of the club and the way that they're able to get so much out of a group of players between the age of 17 and 21 that have come through their academy in the same way that no other club in League Two does or can do. They've got major absences in midfield and attack that would scupper a lot of managerial plans, but Bell just seems to make the most of any situation that he has without much fuss, and I just think that's such an impressive trait. And, you know, I'm talking about the development of all these individual players, and so much of that comes back to the way that the manager sets them up to thrive rather than exposing their their weaknesses. 
and he's able to do it playing a you know switch up the style quite regularly it's it's just so impressive uh, and they were you know very very good for this 3-1 win very very impressive another 3-1 win another team that won all the games in the last week were MK George they went to Grimsby and won 3-1 yeah, big game of two halves this. Um, Grimmins be really impressive and probably value for their uh, lead at half time. A quick free kick played down the right hand side, and Danny Rose uh, got there just before uh, Lemon Havens and, and slotted it into the back of the net. Interesting, we saw no changes at half time from Scott Lindsay and MK Dons, but definitely a shift in the way they, they look to play. Where, in the, I mean, Game State will play a part in this, but in the first half they dominated possession. Two hundred twenty, sorry, two hundred sixty-five passes to Grimsby's one hundred twenty-five, of which one hundred thirty-nine of those were in their own half. But in the second half, if you look at the same uh, numbers, it was one six seven plays one three nine, but only forty-nine in their own half, with sixty-eight in the opposition half. So you can see there that MK basically stopping pass around from, from the back, trying to be way more direct, and benefiting from that. Um, Gilby scored the first goal. Um, a really nice uh, cross from Tommy Lee from kind of a central position. And then Aaron the main getting down the right-hand side, f- firing a ball across uh, the six-yard box. And who's there but Fox in the box? Scott Hogan. Scott the hot Hogan. We spoke about last week, um, who scored the kind of goal that I think he will probably score quite a lot of uh, between now and the end of the season. And the points made safe by uh, Lemon Hay Evans late on. So a-, a really big win for MK Dons and Scott Lindsay. Feels like he's starting to get his grip into this side uh, with pretty good results um, Grimsby will feel frustrated that they weren't able to to match their second half performance with their first it's kind of a bit of a theme with them at the moment where having had some really good results against better teams in the league uh, we've recently seen them uh, beaten 3-0 by Donny 4-1 by Walsall and now 3-1 by, by MK so it kind of feels like they're maybe kind of moving towards a, a team that dispatched the poorer teams in the league but can't really handle the, the better so maybe not ideal for them that their next game is, uh, well, their next league game is at Wimbledon and then they go to Chesterfield after that. And Notts County are just easing themselves into the top three, into the automatic promotion spots. They did so with a 1-0 win against Harrogate. Uh, it was Nick Sarula crossing for Jatta, uh, who scored. It's his 10th goal since joining Notts in January. If you add his four assists as well, it is 1.03 goal contributions per 90 just a fantastic piece of recruitment ahead of you know I'm sure that Knotts will say they didn't always expect Langstaff to leave in the summer and I know he did sign a literally sign a new contract in the summer but I also think to have planned his successor and brought him in in January and to be now getting you know basically haven't even hit a bump in the road in terms of output from their number nine really really impressive um and and pretty good for it here i mean harrogate didn't have a shot until after the hour mark they had a couple of efforts after going behind but nothing major so a deserved win i'd say without crowley as well you know we're starting to see giovanni brown a bit more this was his first start in a knots uh, league game same with josh martin who played left wing back here um you know it just shows that they they have been adding quite good players even since you know when they first joined league two we were like god they've got langstaff they've got crowley they've got mcgoldrick they've got jody jones those were players already there or signed uh, as McGoldrick was in the summer. I actually think their recruitment since they've been in League Two has been very impressive as well. That's why you've got a team who are in, in the top three. I also think it hasn't been talked about nearly enough that the team that had an embarrassing defensive record last season, conceding 86 goals, <laughs> the most in the division and also scoring the most in the division, uh, sorry, the second most in the division behind, the third most in the division behind Stockport and Mansfield, have now conceded less than a goal a game, uh, just 12 in their first 14 games. So huge credit should go to Scott Maynard for addressing the clear, clear thing that needed sorting over the summer. Uh, And he's done that very, very well. Uh, Bromley drew 1-0 with Barrow. Great assist from Cuyate for Ghana to put Barrow 1-0 up. And then a penalty right at the end given to Bromley and scored by Michael Cheek. Barrow, not happy about this one. I can understand why. It took me a long time and many replays to see what, the penalty was given for. I think I can see it now. Um, Spence had an arm up, basically, in an unnatural position. Did the ball hit the arm? I can't really tell from from the camera angle, but a signal really for Barrow, who I think put in a pretty good away performance for the majority of that game, but didn't get the win. And then 2-0 all draws. Both of them had over three expected goals in the game with no goals scored. Fleetwood and Newport drew 0-0, uh, despite over three XG combined. That was Harrington giving away a penalty, uh, the Fleetwood keeper, and then saving it. Uh, and in the other game between Accrington and Nil and uh, Walsall, um, yeah, these weren't just matches that happened. It's quite a lot in them. 
Um, but nil nil. They really, really happened. Oh boy, did they happen! Uh, FA Cup first round next week. Uh, so I'm excited about uh, getting into some of that next Monday on the pod. There will also be a strong focus on the second tier, the championship. So join us for that and the betting show on Thursday. Thank you very much for listening. Go very well. <laughs>